Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along this evening. We hope you find this a really interesting event. Uh, my name's Hannah Rowlands. I'm the communications manager for the NKIT project, NKIT standing for Networked Quantum Information Technologies. And we're a, a large research consortium led out of Oxford University working towards building a quantum computer prototype. Um, so all I really wanted to say before we start was just to say this is your event, you the audience. We really want you to find out what you're interested in about quantum technology. So please feel free to ask questions um, and yes, get as much out of it as you can. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start now with Tim Cook. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Tim Cook. I'm the co-director of the Oxford Project. And my area of responsibility is user engagement. Uh, since we haven't made a quantum computer, there aren't any users. So you would think, you'd think my job was quite easy. Um, I spent my life in technology transfer. And in technology transfer, you find some technology, and you find somebody who wants it, and you transfer the technology. Um, quantum computing is like that, except we haven't got the technology yet. So we're engaging with the people who um, may be interested in it, may have views on the way it should go. Um, so with that, let, let me introduce the uh, program for this evening. I, I'm going to talk for a bit. Uh, we then have Professor Meta Atatur from the University of Cambridge, who's going to talk about quantum computing, and Melanie Smallman from University College London, looking at the implications of this. Um, and then you can all have a go. Um, and uh, we'd be interested in comments, questions, disagreements, uh, whatever you'd like to throw at us. Uh, we will all be sitting here. Um, so let me start with the easy questions. What are quantum technologies? Recent advances in science mean that we can now do some things better and we can do some new things that we couldn't do before. For example, we can make better sensors. So if you're looking for underground pipes and voids or you've gone to an acceleration sensor so you can navigate without GPS, there are quantum technologies that can make both those sensors more effective than they are. We can make better devices for imaging, so you can see through fog and even look round corners. Now, don't get too excited about looking round corners, but it, they have got images out of line of sight, and if you've got time afterwards, I can explain how they do it. Um, quantum technology, technologies will lead to better communications. By better communications, I mean, uh, so your communication with the bank can't be hacked. And finally, better computers. So we can develop new drugs and materials. So what can quantum technologies do for you? If, you're in, if your company is involved in precision measurement, we can offer you improved signal-to-noise ratio. If you're involved in imaging, clearer pictures. If you're involved in communications, denser coding, so you can send more stuff down your fiber or in cryptography, guaranteed security. And I'll talk a bit more about that. And in computation, exponentially faster processing. So how do they work? Now, this is the really flaky bit. I was a physicist in the 60s, but we have in the audience and on the panel some proper physicists. So any really hard questions could you address to them? Um, so I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Rupesh, who is here. He, his, um, he works with me in, in the Clarendon Lab, and Iris Choi, who also works with me, they are proper scientists. I will give you the Mickey Mouse version. So items and photons, which are just bits of light, have some peculiar properties that you just don't see in the macroscopic world where we live. When I did physics, it was very straightforward. You could see what you were doing, and everything did sensible things. These lot don't. So, for example, they seem to know where, what each other are doing, even when they're miles apart. Or they can be in more than one place at a time. This is very unsettling. Or they can be pointing up and down at the same time and all angles in between. Now, I don't believe a word of this, but there are now demonstrations that can't possibly work unless some of this is true. And we'll see more of that later. So I'm sort of reluctantly having to disbelieve my senses and think, perhaps there is something in this, even though it's counter to common sense and my everyday experience. Um, a few years ago, 
Um, Mr. Willits, who was then the Minister of Science, decided to spend 270 million of your pounds, O taxpayer, thank you very much, on a national programme to get the UK to maintain its position at the front of developing these potential new technologies. It was announced in the autumn statement and the programme started in December 2014. And the idea is to exploit the potential of this new science and develop a portfolio of emerging technologies with benefit to the UK. So um, this was long before Brexit, but we wanted to spend the UK's taxpayers' money on the commercial benefit of the UK. There are in the programme industry, government and academia all working together, but this is not a research programme. Although it's administered by the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, it is a commercial, commercially oriented program. Um, as well as universities, there are all these public bodies, uh, the EPSRC, BIS, or whatever it's called this week, Innovate UK, which is what we used to call the Technology Strategy Board, um, Knowledge Transfer Network, DSTL is the MOD's lab, National Physical Lab, and CESG, which is GCHQ at uh, Cheltenham, and of course they are quite interested in secure communications. Um, where the EPSRC's part of the uh, uh, 270 million went was 120 went into establishing four un techno quantum technology hubs, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, 15 million went into training hubs. Um, the generation of scientists who drive this forward are probably not, with due respect to those present, the, s the current senior guys, it's probably the next generation of scientists, so we wanted to be training them early. There's 25 million gone into strategic capital equipment and 50 million into individuals to fund their acquiring expertise as technology fellowships. Um, and that, that's how it splits between capital skills, knowledge transfer and innovation. And the big green one are the hubs, which I want to talk about next. So here's the hub network. Of the 270, 120 million went into four hubs to explore the properties of quantum mechanics and how they can be harnessed to, uh, to drive the uh, e economy forward. Um, 16 applied, eight were shortlisted, four were awarded. Um, one is in Birmingham, sensors and metrology. We have uh, Vincent here somewhere who will be on the panel at the end. He's from the Birmingham hub. The Glasgow hub works on quantum enhanced imaging. The York hub works on quantum communications and the Oxford hub works on quantum computing. Um, of the 120 million, uh, the Oxford hub got 38 million of which 20 million was capital spend and, tw and the rest was five years of operations. So a word about the Birmingham hub there, developing quantum assisted sensors that detect underground ducts, cables, voids, much deeper than ground penetrating radar. Um, if, if they reduce the amount of, ti of time spent digging up roads, that will be a benefit to us all and indeed the national economy. They can also measure changes in gravity over different locations and have devices to measure accelerations. The impact of both of these is if you're in a submarine in the middle of the Atlantic and you have a, a gravity map of the floor of the Atlantic, the gravity is not the same as you travel around, that gives you some measure of your position. Furthermore, if you measure your acceleration and your rotation on a continuing basis and you knew where you started, you, know, you still know where you are. So this produces a navigation system, a so-called inertial navigation system, which is independent of GPS, which I'm sure you know is, could be switched off by the US or indeed moved by the US at any time. So being independent of that is probably quite good. The Glasgow hub um, is developing more and more sensitive imaging. So they've got some beautiful, if you look at their website, they've got some beautiful um, photographs of gas leaks. Um, they are set up to develop the added effect quantum technologies can bring to imaging. And as I said, they recently demonstrated a way of seeing around corners. And this only works because of the fantastic sensitivity of quantum assisted light detectors. The communications hub in York, um, they, by using quantum technologies, 
you can connect to people via standard fiber optic phone networks and the communications cannot be intercepted. And if an attempt is made at intercepting the communications, the people at both ends will know. The York Hub is developing cash cards that can't be copied and a quantum communications set network is currently being set up between Cambridge, London and Bristol to see whether uh, we can actually reliably do quantum communication over a distance. Uh, which brings me to the Oxford Hub. Um, we've tasked over five years, ending in to, uh, December 2019, to develop a module that can be expanded to produce a quantum computer. The significance of this is quantum computation, as you will hear, is a statistical process that doesn't work every time. So if you produce a quantum computing module, it has errors. You can build into it error processing. If you add two of them together, the question is whether you add in more errors or you add in more error processing. We believe now in Oxford, we've got the latter. So uh, we already have working quantum bits. This happens to be an area where Oxford is particularly good. We can connect them together. Um, we've got uh, another Oxford speciality is optical communications. So we're optimistic. Um, Meta who's a member of the Oxford Hub based in Cambridge, will talk about this um, with much more authority than I can. So these are the partners in the Oxford Hub. There are scientists in Oxford in the Department of Physics, Materials, Engineering and Computer Science. But there are also individuals that we've invited to join in these other universities, each of whom bring their own specialities. Um, we, as you heard, um, are tasked with working closely with instruments, uh, with, with uh, industrial companies, and uh, we've had a lot of support from Oxford Instruments. Uh, they're working with our researchers, developing um, products and techniques here that will feed into their uh, new products, and also um, helping us understand what you need from the academic end to produce stuff um, appropriate for a new market. And I'm pleased to say that Ian Derbyshire is here somewhere, who's the new chief executive of Oxford Instruments. Um, if you haven't met him, he's the man in the red tie at the back. Um, all four hubs have industrial support. When we applied for this, we had about 20 companies who wrote letters of support saying they will donate this, they will contribute that. Um, on the bottom of the board over there, there's all their names. Um, their intellectual input, as well as their financial input, I think, is crucial to the ongoing success of turning this super whizzy university science into real commercial products. The main objective is to keep the UK ahead of our global competitors in this new emerging set of technologies. And a crucial part of this is that industry and the public are involved in what we're doing so the impact is as early as possible. And we don't have the adverse sort of impact that genetically modified crops and nanotechnology had. Um, I wouldn't suggest for a minute that the public should be kept in the dark or should be uncritical. The more involvement we have at this stage, the more likely we are to A, do the right thing, and B, not be misunderstood, both of which are crucial. So I was invited to um, answer the question, how will quantum technologies change your business? Well, of course, it depends what business you're in, but you will certainly be able to do some of what you do better and more quickly. So if you look for pipes or gas leaks, you'll do it better. If you want to communicate securely, you will certainly do it better. If you want to look for new pharmaceuticals, you can do it better. Quantum computers have a much bigger, faster, and more rapidly expandable capacity than normal computers. At the moment, you have a big supercomputer, if you have a little molecular model of a drug and a little model of the uh, keyhole it has to fit, you can do this. But you can only do it with small molecules. Some drugs are big molecules, can't do it. You can with a quantum computer. Um, if your business is sifting medical symptoms, there was a, an item on Radio 4 last week of a cancer doctor who, by looking at big data, was able to predict when his patients were going to have a recurrence of their cancer well before anything was clinically measured. And he did this by having a huge database of other people who'd had relapses and taking some measurements from his uh, 
current patients. So he could tell them that this was going to happen and do something about it at an early stage. And uh, as you know, with cancer, that's, that's crucial. But more than that, I think there'll be new companies and probably new industries. When they made the first microprocessor, no one had heard of Bill Gates or Microsoft. And I think there will be new companies and new industries that come out of this that we've not heard of yet. So if you're an investor, getting involved now is probably quite a good idea. I wouldn't sign any very big checks, but knowing what's going on and being ready for the psychological moment is probably a good idea. I emphasize that the map is still being drawn, but the UK is actually in a good position to benefit from these opportunities if we get the sociology right. And I think that will be the limiting factor on whether Mr. Willits's 270 million of your pounds um, was a research project or whether it really was a commercial enterprise. So uh, that's our email address. There are people from NKIT all over the place here tonight, so do catch them. If you go to this website, you will learn more than you could possibly want to know about what we're doing. So I'll stop there and bring on a real scientist. So uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Meta Astor from the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much for uh, coming and um, also for the opportunity to talk. It's, uh, it, it, we don't usually get the chance to talk to um, non-scientists, uh, let's say, or non-academics uh, immediately. We like to go to our conferences and have uh, our meetings, and that's great. But uh, talking to uh, your family about what you do is probably the hardest thing I have to do and explaining what, what I'm actually doing in the lab. So this is kind of like that. So I'm uh, uh, hopefully um, I'll, I'll pass across the message that we're, we're trying to do something that is relevant uh, and hopefully beyond what you think already uh, when it comes to quantum technologies. Um, do interrupt and ask questions if you like to. Um, uh, hopefully we can turn that into a conversation also uh, later on. So what I'll do is a bit of highlights. I, 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 I'll be uh, fair, I selected, pre-selected particular topics rather than a full-blown um, um, survey of everything that goes on in MKIT, uh, mainly in, uh, keeping in mind that perhaps not everything we do is, uh, is as popular uh, or, or in the media as, as we expect, so hopefully uh, um, you'll find it interesting. So the first thing I'm, I'm showing here is actually a graph from um, IEEE Journal Spectrum, which uh, Every, uh, every year or so publishes a report on where we're going regarding the Moore's Law. So the blue one is where the prediction was in 2013 already. And in 2015, this is um, how small, smallest features of circuits, electronic circuits, we're going to make. And the x-axis is the years. The blue curve was optimistic, saying that we'll keep developing smaller and smaller and smaller. The, blue, the uh, red curve, or the orange, slightly colorblind, the origin, I believe, is the 2015 report that says, actually, no. Actually, we're going to pin it at the 10 nanometer, or actually 7 nanometer boundary. And we will no longer actually uh, expect much smaller devices than that. So that's where it stops. That's where we are actually openly saying now that the Moore's law is no longer continuing. That means the usual the business as usual that we expected over decades, many decades, where things just get faster, things get smaller, things get, uh, we put more transistors on the same chip and we just carry on, it's just not gonna happen. So this is the moment where a lot of uh, companies are actually investing in multiple other alternatives, alternative materials, alternative approaches to uh, uh, circuits and electronics and what that means, maybe spintronics, electronics, other types of tronics, if you wish. Um, and also, this is the era, I, I, I quite like this phrase, the 20th century was the era of small. You, the goal was making things smaller. 21st century is now the era of efficient. We're trying to make things efficient uh, so that they actually function. They use less energy, so they're energy efficient. Uh, they're processing efficient, maybe other alternative techniques. The software part of the story is being developed stronger now than before. Uh, and this is where quantum side comes in. It's a fundamentally different approach uh, to, um, to computing uh, if, it, uh, if we can manage to uh, put it together. Uh, so hopefully that's where the quantum sort of fits in the second one uh, that we're fundamentally going forward. All right, so with that, uh, the world is active. So this is a map of 
similar, smaller, in some cases larger, but similar, let's say, um, scale of uh, activities like NKIT and the, the rest of the quantum technology hubs spread over the world. And you see that it's, uh, we do have competition, but we have a good position in, in this broad uh, coverage of the, um, uh, of the map. Um, the key message is everywhere out there, you'll find a, a quantum center, a quantum technology center trying to figure out what is feasible, what is possible, what is achievable, and what is it that we're overlooking at the moment? Because not everything we think of regarding quantum technologies is the full story. Maybe there are things we haven't thought of yet. So that's all the activities going on that, that puts UK in a uh, good spot as well. So around the world, this is happening uh, with discussions with businesses, as well as public, as well as uh, among academics. Uh, this is the slide that um, Tim showed already. Uh, I'm in that other small town, Cambridge. Um, uh, and the reason I put it up there is to show that NCAT actually is not one monolithic block of research. It is distributed, even the academics are distributed. Now on top of that, we can put the business partners. Uh, so it's really a spread network, uh, uh, which resonates well with the, the titles and networked quantum information technologies. So with that theme, that, that notion of distributed uh, uh, effort, I'd like to highlight this one research paper by Jeff Kimball that came out in 2008. And basically the paper says, wait a second, instead of having a block of a quantum computer, why don't we have a distribution, a network of, uh, of a quantum system that works like a quantum computer, does the same thing, but instead has these nodes, quantum nodes, coupled by quantum channels. So instead of everything being in proximity, all the interactions are formed by things talking to each other next to each other, let's just explode the whole thing, spread it all into space, so that we have flexibility of removing and putting other things, other parts, as long as they're interconnected by whatever that quantum channel is. He was kind enough to give us a red arrow to say that's a quantum channel, so it's up to us to figure out what that means physically. Uh, and he also gave us a box that says quantum node, so go and figure out what your quantum node is. That's the, the role of the academics, more or less, trying to figure out what goes in there. So that's why in the, um, uh, in, in the news you hear quant the quantum scientists have made progress in quantum computing with trapped ions, that's the node. And someone else says, indistinguishable photons have achieved, blah, blah, blah. that's the quantum channel. So basically different segments, different parts of the, hopefully the bigger picture, uh, is being pursued by multiple physical systems, light, microwaves, ions, atoms, solid state. We're constantly pursuing all of these different opportunities to see uh, what would work, what combination would work. The advantage of this arrangement, I hope you appreciate, is that the quantum nodes, the boxes, don't have to be the same. Some boxes can be tailored for a particular purpose, fast operations, while other boxes are more for storage and they're uh, a different physical system. So that hybrid approach is suitable with this uh, geometry. Um, I'll quickly um, uh, highlight these. So I'll actually open this up. So basically the, um, the, the typical approach that, um, that uh, uh, is promising, and, and it's the one that NKIT actually is, follow, is, is following at the moment, is to have trapped ions. That's the main flagship uh, uh, project. So what you're seeing there is uh, atom inside optical cavity. There are two mirrors facing each other. That forms an optical cavity. Um, the, the red is the, the resonating photon states, if you will, inside the cavity. And the atoms are in there. Those are the quantum bits. And then connecting between them is the, the red arrow, as I uh, mentioned. That's the photons bouncing back and forth between the cavities. That's the physical realization uh, that uh, Anki is also uh, looking to uh, put together through trapped, trapped ions. So you see that the two things you need then is the quantum bits must be very good, long-lived quantum states, their uh, coherence properties must be very good, and at the same time, the photons they generate and exchange between each other must be really high quality. So here's what kind of, what, what, what kind of looks like uh, when we talk about those quantum nodes. The top is the atomic chip. That's the chip that holds the atoms together. And below, you're seeing, I think, eight. Do I count right? Eight eight trapped calcium uh, ions uh, forming that one of those nodes. So that's the, the principal uh, flagship project within uh, NKIT for a quantum computer, that one of those nodes that you saw is indeed this package. Connection between the nodes will be through uh, photons. That's the, uh, that's the concept. Now, of course, it's an interface of atoms and solid state because the chip is solid state. However, we're also working with alternative nodes, alternative systems, uh, which actually is exclusively in solid state, the quantum 
features, quantum systems within solid state already integrated. So both uh, avenues are being pursued. Um, in, on the process, in the, in the let's say, the, the endeavor to get to a quantum computer in that sense, there are other things we can do on the way. And this is one example. Even with, within computing concept, without having to look for very different technologies, even within computing concept, here's a question that uh, we can answer. And this is something that actually uh, Oxford was uh, uh, quite a pioneer uh, in, in achieving this. Uh, I think most of you would know what this game is. You put a coin from the top and it lands somewhere in one of the options at the bottom. And this is a very good random looking um, uh, experiment because you can't really guess where it's going to go. Actually, you should be able to. You should be able to calculate what the distribution is going to be. But if I start making this bigger and bigger, the problem gets exponentially difficult. If I start changing those pins to be different from each other, then it becomes even more complicated because each step you have to recalculate what the pro probability distributions are. So that is a very difficult problem to solve, it turns out. And this is a problem where the solution is extremely simple if we have a quantum system. And the quantum system was, that was proposed and realized in Oxford, is using single photons going through uh, beam splitters, waveguides, optical waveguides that, in, uh, that uh, come together and, and spread out again, similar to those decision points, the pins of the original uh, wooden board. And that gives you a distribution at the end. Photons interfering in, in, in poor, uh, pure quantum domain gives us a distribution called boson sampling, is what we call this, um, and if you go in and tailor the, the beam splitter properties at each of those nodes, this corresponds to tailoring the properties of those pins uh, to whatever you like, so that you get, you get to see what the distribution would be without actually doing uh, a full simulation or building up the board, if you will. So imagine the board being one million steps. The process would take the time it takes for the photon to travel the distance of the, of the whole uh, picture, which is on the order of tens of uh, picoseconds. So it's an extremely fast calculator if you want. This turns out, you might say, why am I calculating the board? What's, uh, what, what, why is that good for me? It turns out that is analogous to many uh, problem solving, uh, many problems that need solving that includes um, uh, quantum chemistry and uh, simulation of molecules, uh, especially large molecules. So there's great similarity and there's, there's a lot of effort now in quantum chemistry reinvented again Quantum chemistry was an old subject, but it's reinvented again in the simulation, quantum simulation of chemistry uh, using uh, purely photons. All right, so the time scales, I'll uh, rush through a bit. We have a, a long-term goal of quantum computing, as I mentioned, and a lot of things will happen as we get closer and closer to it. We have the shorter term uh, already achievements called boson sampling, and this is already being pursued. Um, and then we have even perhaps shorter term goals, like proper random number generators where, you know, every user is now powerful enough with their computers to figure out that your random number isn't random, therefore, micro-bidding is, is, uh, is no longer a fair game. So you do need the ran uh, true randomness uh, of random number generators. Secure keys, as uh, Tim mentioned. Um, quantum sensors is an aspect that I'll cover uh, now in a, a bit more detail. Uh, why would you want to use quantum sensors when we already have sensors? What does quantum bit uh, bring into the picture? So here's an example. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is a quantum sensor. It's a quantum sensor because it wouldn't work if quantum physics wasn't with us. If purely classical physics would not give us MRI. Just like semiconductors. You wouldn't have semiconductors if you didn't have quantum physics. The only reason you have a gap in a semiconductor is because of quantum physics. So in that sense, quantum physics is at the heart of everything we do anyways. So why are we talking about quantum technologies here? We're trying to take it beyond the, the natural existence of quantum physics in our, our world, we're trying to figure out whether there could be even more advantage to using the old bits of quantum physics, the more philosophical uh, concepts, the entanglement, the non-locality, the um, uh, non-cloning properties of a quantum state. All of these that are not, they come together with the semiconductor that you're used to as quantum, but quantum also predicts these other spooky, if you will, uh, weird counterintuitive aspects would like to see if quantum 2.0, using those aspects, can be beneficial or not. So that's, that's what we mean by quantum now, as opposed to quantum 40 years ago. If you will. Uh, so this is MRI, uh, and it gives you a certain um, uh, resolution of being able to image. So all it does is it, it maps out spins. It picks up magnetic field due to precession of spins in your brain or molecule or something. Uh, it's nuclear magnetic resonance, actually, but 
public didn't like nuclear, so the word is magnetic resonance imaging. We're not saying what resonance, but it's still nuclear. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with nuclear energy, so that was something else. Uh, so I, perhaps this relates to the next talk, actually. Um, but this is large scale, so the key thing is these are very large scale uh, measurements. The features you can see are, are bulky, brain, half a brain, quarter of a brain, that's about it. So these are attempts to make it smaller, attempts to look at smaller things. So now we're in the domain of talking about single molecules, single uh, cells, uh, the life cycle of a single cell as it goes through certain uh, stages of life. We'd like to, rather than look at big, large ensembles and of beaker science, we're trying to see single individual features. So these are three attempts going on right now, the forefront uh, competitors, on trying to detect not 10 to 20 spins to get some signal in an MRI machine, but one spin. All of these have approached slowly to the capability of being able to see one, not 10 to 20. And the reason why all of these are approaching this limit is because they're using quantum features. The middle one, nanosquid, is using purely superconductivity and quantum uh, interference. So that you can't do without quantum physics. Uh, the one that's included with an ANCID is the last one, actually. It's the uh, diamond, nanodiamond. It's single atomic impurities in nanodiamond that, is, that are sensitive to external magnetic, electric, and, uh, and, and temperature gradients. All right. So that's what I'll talk about today. That's the one I work on, actually. And here's the mini uh, sales pitch justification why the diamond one, the diamond option, is, is interesting. Um, you're seeing uh, sensitivity as a function of um, detected target separation. How small the volume can we actually uh, uh, detect with these nanodiamonds or with these uh, materials that we work in. And there are multiple um, techniques that are highlighted. And the diagonal lines that you see are the um, one million electron spin sensitivity, thousand electron spin sensitivity, single electron spin sensitivity, and single nuclear spin sensitivity. And you see only one of the species techniques actually makes it to the single nuclear spin sensitivity, and that's the diamond at this point. So there is advantage that comes from using diamond, which as you know, is one of the hardest materials, obviously. It, these sensors will work at 4 Kelvin, minus 290, all the way to plus 300, 400 degrees. Very high pressure to very uh, ultra high vacuum. They work uh, it under all of these conditions. So in that sense, it gives you this flexibility to use it deep inside an oil well or inside a, a cell. And that's the second part is what I'm going to talk about. So we, I started with NMR, so I'm going to speed up. I think I'm running out of time. I'm going to speed up now. But the key things I want to highlight, what we can do with these diamond impurities. Diamond itself is colorless. Some of the diamonds that you'll see will, be, uh, it will have a hue of pink. It's the pink color that comes from these atomic impurities that we work with. Those are the individual ones. Don't take too many of them. Take one. And that one is a quantum object. And we optically control that quantum object and find out what it tells us about its environment. And this environment can be as small as a billionth of a, what is that, billionth of a meter volume, if you want. Instead of one meter cube area, we're working with a billionth of that uh, on each axis. Uh, and so this is, as far as I know, the smallest volume you can do in an MRI uh, spectroscopy, essentially. And this is detecting hydrocarbons and, and other features, the nuclear spins in those. Second one below is an example of how in these centers, the nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, were used to detect live motion, in, in motion, C. elegans cells, or uh, uh, the, the, uh, the animals, I suppose. Um, and they have magnetic uh, uh, materials inside them. And this is a measurement of how they align themselves with respect to these magnetic materials, um, uh, these deposits that, that exist in them, this iron. And they align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. Um, this is another example. We can control the modality of operation. So these little 10 nanometer nanosensors don't all, only measure magnetic field. They can also be made to measure temperature at the same time. This is a, basically a nanodiamond that is measuring the temperature inside the cell, not the temperature of the cell. We can measure temperature at different locations inside a cell that is living and going through a process. Now, why is that important? Um, preventative medicine our colleagues in working in preventive medicine comes back and tells us, we don't want to wait until cancer spreads to a quarter of the kidney and then we chop it off. We want to find out what processes happen inside one cell prior to that cell officially turning into a cancerous one. What happens inside 
ion concentrations, um, temperature change because of extra uh, activity, energy activity, um, uh, thickness of the uh, uh, cell wall potential changing, therefore the, the uh, potential uh, of, uh, or thickness of the cell changing, therefore the potential, electric potential changing, all of these features, can they be indicators at the single cell level that this cell eventually will become cancerous? So this is why uh, we're, we're working on these nanodiamond uh, uh, sensor uh, uh, techniques to figure out, can we detect processes that happen inside a living cell and then wait for it in the whole lifetime of the cell because it's not cancerous, it doesn't hurt the cell itself. It, the cell is inert to the nanodiamond. They love it actually, they eat them. We give them nanodiamonds, the cells go in there and eat them and then they carry on, no problem. And then we wanna see what happens in the process before then they turn, um, turn cancerous. Um, so this is the, these are the um, types of experiments we're actually pursuing now with Cancer Research uh, UK, essentially. These are nanodiamonds, they're little, tiny little shards of diamond, and those are lung cancer cells, and the idea is we put them together and they actually go in and find them and they eat them. For some reason they like them, but they don't do anything with them afterwards. So we actually take them optically and then push them to where we want them, or tag them to certain parts in the cell, and then start monitoring. They live forever. The NV centers, the diamond lives forever, the cells don't, obviously. All right, so to sum it up, there's a long-term goal that you will have heard of uh, many times before, the quantum computing part. It may or may not be as accessible to you. I'm happy to talk to you more about it. But basically, there are two sides uh, pushing hard within the NKIT um, uh, remit. The actual physical hardware, trying to put it all together as clusters of quantum bits connected by light. There is the architecture part of it, the software part of it being pursued uh, very strongly is simply putting quantum as an adjective to computing the approach most suitable for that architecture, or are there other ways to what we understand as computing? Is the, basically the second question. Um, intermediate goals are many, I won't talk about it, but the short-term goals, hopefully I, I made it clear that with the advent of, the, of, of these sensors, all interacted by light, we can also interact, we can also uh, couple them uh, so that we end up with distributed sensor uh, system. So it's I like to push you more towards thinking instead of IoT, uh, having a very small scale version of IoT as a IOQT, if you will. And finally, I'll leave you with this image. I think it's a profound image. It's a cover of a um, computer magazine called Byte. It's from 1981, and this is the future computer. That's what they picked as their as their. Uh, of course, they're not um, they're not making fun of it. They're actually genuinely saying, where can we go with it? Are we gonna make it smaller? You see what 20th century meant, small, right? That's, that, that floppy disk is actually smaller now as the, as the concept. The point is, I believe right now, this is what we're trying to do. I believe right now at the moment, when we talk about quantum technologies, most likely this is the picture we have when we try to take what we have today and, uh, and project it to what we should have in the, in the next 10 or 20 years. So it's very likely that if we push in that direction, we'll end up with other solutions uh, that involve proper quantum physics and, and benefit from the um, advantages it offers, uh, from sensors all the way to computing, but it may not necessarily look the way it looks now. But I, I do think that it's, it's still a good lead to, to push in that direction, and I'm, I'm sure we'll bump into a bit of a random walk uh, uh, discoveries as well. I'll end with that. Thank you very much. starting at the end. That's interesting. Okay, um, well, I'm Melanie Smallman, um, and I'm from uh, UCL in London, and I've been asked to talk about responsible research and innovation, which um, I think is relevant in this context for two reasons. So firstly, the serious reason is because this is an idea that has been that is evolving and growing and developing and that we're developing very much with some key technologies such as quantum computing so um, as others have said about engaging users at the beginning this is very much the spirit of responsible research and innovation 
But it also occurred to me, um, where, particularly when Tim was speaking just now, that so I'm in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at UCL, and we're kind of the quantum sociologists of science, because we think our standpoint is very much that um, science, innovation, and technology, yes, we agree, it's, bring, it's promising great futures and bringing great benefits to the world, but we also think that it's bringing really bad things and that those things are intertangled. So it's kind of like a quantum good and bad mixed up together. So what I wanted to do was um, talk a bit about, I'll, I'll explain what we mean by responsible research and innovation and how it can be used to develop better technologies, but also just to highlight some of the kind of issues that we think are really important, not necessarily to do with quantum. I'm not going to talk about photons and ions. I'm going to talk about other technologies. But what we can learn from past experience and things that have happened in the recent history that we could do better um, in the future. And I think so one of the big ideas that has kind of led to this idea of responsible research innovation is a concept that we call in science and technology studies co-production, which is a different version to how everyone else means it. And so what we really believe in science and technology studies is that the science and the technologies we develop both reflect the world that we live in, so we develop the technologies we want, but they also build the world we live in. So we, the, the, the science we do and the technology we build both reflect the world we live in that shapes the questions we ask, but at the same time, the technologies have very profound effects on the world that we live in. And I think quantum is set to be one of those examples. And the, the objective, I hate this picture. I'll talk about it afterwards and I'll say why I hate it, apart from it being creepy. Um, the, the, the real sort of objective of responsible research and innovation is to move beyond this kind of trope that we say in science, we want to do the best science in the world. That is not good enough. Science is one of the most powerful changes of our world. We need to be doing the best science for the world. And that's the idea behind responsible research and innovation. Not just the best science in the world, but the best science for the world. And it's largely come, so it's very much driven at the moment by a European perspective on this. So the European Commission has identified these grand challenges, but I think they're all kind of relevant. When we hear scientists and scientific institutions talk, you know, we need science because we've got a growing population, because we've got an aging population, because we're facing climate change. So science and innovation has got these huge promises to tackle these massive challenges ahead. But at the same time, some of them fail, some of them have unexpected or negative consequences or are controversial. So we've just picked some random, um, well not random, but some, some samples of, of, of examples. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of conversation right now about robots which could be providing care for elderly people. I'm getting older, I don't know about anyone else. I'm not sure I want to be looked after by a robot. I might prefer humans. So, you know, there are downsides to these ideas. It might save the government money to have a robot caring for me, but actually, perhaps it will make me a less happy or less comfortable person. And issues around, I mean, drones, of course, on one hand, have the potential taking military, taking personnel out of war zones and allowing wars to be fought from, from safer distances. But at the same time, there's huge research that's evolving now about the psychological, just the psychological effects on the soldiers themselves of what, what the experience is of using a drone to track a target, a human target, for months and months on end to see this person interacting with their family, going to work, getting to know the people they hang out with, and then at the moment being told, whether you're in Washington, whether you're in California, press the button and kill them, having got to know them. These are huge, huge consequences, and that's not even talking about you know, what it must be like to live in a world where you're watched by drones and so on. And I think th those are quite kind of obvious downsides, but, but other things about 
benefits are not equally shared from these technologies. So, you know, a couple of the presenters, particularly Tim, talked about the great wealth to come from um, quantum computing. But we know that technologies are not equally shared. So this is just a very crude example, which I'm obsessed about at the moment, is Uber. So all of my students use Uber. They think it's wonderful. They're getting 8 million customers a day are getting cheaper taxis, which is great on one hand. The guy, Travis Kalanick, the, the founder, is worth is that 6 billion. He's worth 6 billion alone. And they're employing 500 to 1,000 people, software engineers, in actually quite a deprived part of um, the US at the moment. And they're funding new research. But around the world, there's massive protests from taxi drivers. My local taxi firm is constantly complaining about Uber because they're driving salaries down so low that some of their drivers are earning less than $3 an hour. And even in the UK, pay, pay is being driven down by them. So, you know, this is changing the shape of work for people. It's changing how cities feel for people. Of course, the phenomenon of stateless profit, which has been enabled, enabled by it. But this, I mean, this is an important picture, right? So 500 to 1,000 people employed, they're all men. Most of them are men. So these great jobs are creating huge wage inequalities between is the, the gender pay gap is coming from these high wages in technology, which women are not being employed in. So I think it's a slightly unsubtle example, but I think it kind of explains very clearly how the benefits of technology are not as straightforward as saying everyone's going to do well from this. Some people do extremely well and some people do extremely badly. And the implications of those are driving people's attitudes to these technologies. So if we're concerned that we don't want a new GM crisis or a new nano backlash, we need to be thinking about these issues because these are the issues which shape ordinary people's perspective on technologies. And I think the diamond example was a nice example of this, you know, the old story that it's the biggest part of the um, pharmaceutical research goes to the diseases of the rich. So it's something like less than 10% of the pharmaceutical budget is spent on 90% of the world's health problems. So the pharmaceutical industry is huge in the UK, is huge in, in the West, but it doesn't touch the lives of people in, in developed countries, certainly not in the way that we think about it here. And added to that, the research, um, there's lots of research done around how, how society wants to interact with science and technology. So the Eurobarometer survey, the most recent one, they said that 77% of Europeans believe that science and technology has a positive impact. So that's great. They're really supportive of it. 62% believe that it's changing our life too fast and 55% think that the public dialogue is, involved, is required, that they want to talk about it, that they want to be involved in these decisions. So this runaway train is not something that's out of their control. Um, and I, know, I mean, I don't know, do people know about smart meters? I always find this is quite a surprising story. So the UK government is currently rolling out smart meters and providing us, to, persuading us all to have these gadgets attached to our uh, electricity meters so that you can know how much electricity you're using when, you can figure out which appliances are getting used, the, using the most electricity, and by comparing your usage to everyone else's, you can then modify your behavior and save the planet by not boiling the kettle quite as much as, as you should, which, you know, that's, that's a legitimate thing. But what is happening, more importantly than saving the planet, is the data which the electricity companies are getting. These are just data gathering devices. And in order to have the full benefit of it, you sign over to, to, um, to let the, well, you sign over your data. Does anyone here have a smart meter? Yeah, do, do you know that the police can phone your energy company and ask them for your electricity data? So if you get a parking ticket and they want to deliver it to you in person, the police don't have to go to court. You signed away that in the small print is that you can, the police can call British Gas or whoever and say, um, could you give me Melanie Smallman's electricity usage? Because that might not be that interesting, but it'll certainly tell them when I'm in. It'll certainly tell them how many people are living in my house. 
I think that that's quite an issue. And the people of, of the Netherlands agreed, and they had an enormous protest when the government tried to roll this out because they simply hadn't had the debate about privacy. They hadn't put in place the safeguards that people wanted. And as a result, the smart meter rollout in the Netherlands has, has come to a halt, and it's certainly was halted about three years ago, which, you know, in terms of technology uptake and in terms of the ability of technology to tackle climate change, to improve the way we use energy, it's come to a standstill because people weren't involved in the decisions around it. I'm going to move forward so, and talk about... So the, the thing that, that we're working to try and resolve this is this idea of responsible research and innovation. And in true European style, there's a very wordy definition of it. So the, the kind of, there are many definitions, but one of the least wordy ones is this one. So it's an inclusive approach to research and innovation to ensure that societal actors work together during the whole process so that the processes and outcomes of research are better aligned with the values, needs, and expectations of society. Which is great, it's a lofty aim, but how do we do it? So, um, the past couple of years, I've been working on a project, and there's various projects to, that are happening to try and figure out how on earth we do that. So what are the things we need to do? And it's kind of, in one sense, it's an umbrella that we want to bring together all of the actors in research and innovation. So many of the people in the room, researchers, educators, policymakers, businesses, and civil society to talk about issues like ethics, gender equality, governance, open access, education, and public engagement. And the one at the bottom that's really important are the societal outcomes. So how do we actually do research and innovation that enables us to address these social outcomes? And we believe that it's bringing these groups and these issues together in a constructive way. And we've kind of we, we've produced four questions or four process themes. So one is around diversity and inclusion. So being sensitive to research biases, thinking about originality, including diverse voices and making results beneficial to a wider community. Now this one is really important and that's what that picture of that horrible pregnant crash test dummy is, is that I don't know if you know this story about the dummies, is that most of the, well, all of the research on crash, car crashes was done on a male crash test dummy. And then they had female ones, but they still didn't know what a pregnant, what, what the effect would be if it was a pregnant woman. So the, it, it was very, very late in the research that they realized that there were really quite big physiological differences between men and women. And yeah, well, and last week I read a paper about, um, this is really ridiculous. So all of the research that's been done on health and fitness, so the effect of fitness on health has been done on men because women have hormonal cycles which upsets, it's, a, it's a, another variable which upsets the experiment. So we don't really know. We don't really know what happens to women's bodies when they exercise because nobody's bothered looking at it because we're too complicated because the standard is, is a man. And it, I mean, it has quite serious, I mean, it, it, that has very serious implications for things like drug testing and so on. And my favorite story at the moment is about voice. So, you know, the computers that do voice stuff, like um, the thing that Stephen Hawking has to speak with. So, I mean, that completely transformed his life and people with those kind of disabilities. And for the first many years, they were a choice of three or four voices. You could pick which voice you had, but they were all male voices. So, I mean, I, I like the sound of my voice. It's kind of part of me. If I had to suddenly speak with a man's voice, it would change my identity and do something. And the reason that you had a choice of three voices was that it was men doing the research. So, that one, enough of that. Um, anticipation and reflection is, is another issue. So, we're trying to get people to think in advance about what the possible issues are that could come out of technology. So not to have this idea, of course there's unintended consequences, but let's sort of go at least of trying to think about what they might be. And also reflecting on the values we bring to research. So what kind of world do we think we are building with quantum computing? 
We're encouraging openness and transparency, so being open about what it is you're trying to do with this and allowing others to talk about it and input into it and challenge it. And then the last one is about responsiveness and adaptive change. So not sticking on a track, but actually listening and moving and being a bit more nimble so that we can get together to the place we want to go rather than where we're stuck going. And so to try and kind of put it into practice, we've, we, we, we sort of say that it's about engaging society more broadly with research and innovation activities, particularly around setting the agenda and deciding what's going to happen, increasing access to results to so be much more open about what's happening, ensuring gender equality both in the process and the content of research, taking account the ethical dimension throughout the process so that it's not an add-on, that we don't believe that we can have the technologies and address the ethics, but understand they're part of the technology, and then promoting formal and informal science education in a similar way so that people become involved in these discussions. Um, and I just want to do a quick advert now. <laughs> to, to try and help people because to, to use those approaches and to think about research and innovation in those ways. We've developed this toolkit, which is a very, very big website. You can't quite see the address there. I should have typed it really small. If anyone's interested, it's ri-tools.eu. And there, there's um, masses of information that you can have. You can look at it from your sort of stakeholder viewpoint tools to enable you to try and do some of these things about engaging people, about reflecting on your research. Um, and we're also doing a big program of training at the moment. So if anyone is interested, there's material to, to train yourself, or there's opportunities to sign up to do courses, or there's opportunities to actually help deliver some of that training. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about responsible research and innovation. Uh, just leave my email address in case anyone's interested in more. Uh, thank you again to everyone for coming along this evening. If you are interested in out in quantum technologies, um, there's an event that we're taking part in in November in London, which these postcards are about, which is a quantum technology showcase, which is going to be um, a big exhibition in London at the QET Conference Centre with hands-on demonstrations of some of the technologies that have been brought up today. So if, if you're interested in actually going and seeing some demonstrations of these technologies, then please do uh, register and come along. Thank you very much. Thank you.